Case's device reserved for wild catastrophes and sudden calls to man the battle stations. That's the cloister bell. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really terribly significant. The cloister bell? Oh no. Hello and welcome to the Cloister Bell podcast. Um, later on we will be talking about a big Finnish audio story. But in the meantime, I'm Liam and I'm joined by Rob. Hi Liam, I'm Rob. <laughs> yeah, sure, good. Yep. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Um... Having a bit of time off, I've just had, well, I've actually, I'm saying that, but I've just had seven long days in work, seven 10-hour shifts in a row. Oh, okay. Uh, but now I've had a few days off, um, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Do you ever feel like when, you, when you've when you had time to have lots of sleep, you remember your dreams a lot better? Is that, I, wo- uh, I, wo- I woke up from this strange dream the other day mm-hmm. um, that I was kind of on a dock on a quayside this is really big guy um following me he mm. massive face loads of stubble he's chasing me and he chases me onto this old timber deck ship and he's starting to throw me around and there's waves crashing over um and he's he's picking up these wooden barrels and just crashing them over my head uh, and i'm i'm really bloody at this state i'm in a bad state and then something rolls along the deck in its a tin of spinach. And that's when I realised I was Popeye. <laughs> so I kind of okay. Good. Right. squeezed it a bit in the air and just ate it. And you know, I was I was Popeye, and I was just beating the crap out of Pluto. I was just wondering what what do you think that means? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. When you return to this dream, it's like, oh my god, it's like it's Rob, all right? What could this possibly mean? Um... I don't know. Turned out fine. watching Popeye? I haven't watched Popeye in a long time. Mm. You see the Robin Williams one? Oh, many, many years ago. Mm. I think it was a kid when I watched it. I remember, I think I watched it a couple of times uh, at my grandmother's. Um, it just happened to be on television. <laughs> um, and I always remember sort of liking the beginning of it and then slowly getting bored as the film went oh. along. I remember I it being okay. For mm. that, as a, through ch- through a child's eyes, though. Yeah, yeah. I came across an old Siskel and Ebert um, thing on YouTube where they were re- re- they were reviewing it, and they quite liked it. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and then uh, Sky Arts does this thing called uh, discovering, and they'll do things where they'll discover uh, film directors or film actors and. Th- They've done loads. It's been going on for years. And there was one uh, I was watching a couple of weeks ago about Robin Williams, funnily enough. Um, and they don't skip Popeye. They they mention it and they talk <laughs> about, you know, how it was a, how it's a good fit. Because th- there's loads. There's ones where I, I've watched uh, where they're talking about like a particular actor or actress. And they'll, they'll quickly skip over certain films. Going, Can't you just talk about those? This is interesting. Um or in the case like there was one um when they were doing Al Pacino they completely skip over the fact that they he did a movie called Cruising which was it's a very controversial film and it's just like hmm, hmm why haven't they mentioned that so it's either oh it's controversial or it's an embarrassment or a blot on the actor's career we'll we'll just skip over it yeah but no, with Robin Williams, they, they they have a section where they were talking about the fact he did Popeye and it was a good vehicle for him and da 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 da. So it may, maybe uh, maybe it's a movie that stands up, but it it hasn't it doesn't seem to have lasted. Like it's not a big part of popular culture at the minute. It's like it doesn't get repeats. Mm. Where is it on streaming? Maybe it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> maybe don't know. Yeah, funny. But then there's there's lots of. Um, Films and stuff that were shown an awful lot when we were kids, but they not that just. Um, funny enough, one thing I've been doing is that I've been rewatching um, Twin Peaks, and Ross Timble, I think his name is. Um, he plays for anyone familiar with the series. He plays Doctor Jacoby, 
and uh, he was do you ever remember that film Tom Thumb so this was a, a film in the late 1950s and he actually played Tom Thumb and I remember as a kid that used, that was actually a really decent film it had a good cast it had good special effects and everything like that and um, it tended to be shown once in a while doesn't I, doesn't seem to be shown anymore and it's not just films like that which may be regarded as like a bit a bit obscure like when was the last I, I don't know maybe maybe it has been someone goes on it was the television last week when was the last time you saw Oliver broadcast well I don't watch much TV but uh, no I haven't seen Oliver in a long time mm. that's a really good movie did you ever um, sorry going back to Popeye <laughs> mm-hmm. did you ever have like the Nintendo game and watch handheld things Oh. It was like a little, a little handheld game, mm-hmm. like two buttons. Yeah, but I remember I had a Popeye one where you'd be catching um, something, and I had like a, I think I had a Snoopy one. I had the dual screen Donkey Kong one, which was quite fun. Mm-hmm. But you don't remember those? It was probably more of like a, I don't know, it was like an eighties thing. No, no, mm-hmm. I, do, uh, I do remember them. I just uh, like vaguely. I did had one or two. I cannot for the life of me remember which ones I had. I think I had may- maybe there was a. I'm sure there was a Lion King one. Oh, right, okay. Uh, I think I may have had that. Um, I think I may have had another one, but I can't for the life of me remember what it was. Oh. I'm not much of a gamer at the moment. No, I'm not. Funny enough, I put the... Uh, last week, uh, I went, oh, it's very rare this happens, but it was like, oh, I'm in the mood. I'll play a video game. So I'll, I'll crank up the PlayStation. So I put the PlayStation on, and then I did an update... And the update didn't take too long. It was like two minutes. But by the time the update happened, I was just oh, I can't be bothered. <laughs> so I just switched it off. Oh, well, that's not bad. Sometimes it can be a good 40 minutes for an update. Mm-hmm. And then you don't have enough gig. And say, oh, my God. <laughs> and then you need a good 20 minutes at least for a session. It's just too time consuming before you've even started playing. Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, but it's it's been a while since I played a, a video game. I find that because time because the, times like passing, uh, like the last time I played a video game, I find it it's becoming more of an effort to want to play. Hmm. I had a um, hunt out of Alien Isolation, and I was playing that last week. Um, had another time to get back into it, so I'm thinking i might pick up the novelization instead <laughs> all right okay if that's an easier way to get through it. yeah yeah <laughs> funny enough I've, uh i think there's a there's a magazine called uh the critic and i was reading last month uh last month uh, and they had uh, a section on novelizations and they were talking about how it used to be you know the, the, they regarded as sort of like schlocky pulp fiction but actually what this article was talking about was how they were really well written and really interesting so it, and they tended to be tied in with films so you would get film novelizations and because they were tied in to the film as a form of publicity they was they were always tend to be released um at the same time as the film which gives it a really unique perspective on the film because sometimes um the writers have only had an early draft or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that was just about to say that. So they, you know, there would be similarities, but there would be an awful lot of differences. And they mentioned, you know, ones where, you know, the the end of the novelization would be completely different to the end of the film and things like that. And they were just saying it's such a, it's such a shame that it's sort of like a dying art form. But if anyone has the opportunity to um, find these novelizations, go out and uh, find them. And it mentioned how the art form is being sort of kept alive by two things. One is video games. Um, so you've got like the novelizations of the Assassin's Creed games. And uh, Doctor Who got mentioned. But it was um, it was only mentioned in about a, a paragraph. And they said, you know, said they were interesting. But they said that there was only there was only one that was really worth reading. And that was the David Whittaker um novelization of the first Dalek story. Right, okay. You had that. Yeah, yeah. And they were saying that, you know, it's it's it, it's a bit gritty, it's got an edge, and the fact it's it's written from the perspective of Ian um makes it completely different to 
the um the the pulpy pointless crappy versions i'm paraphrasing <laughs> essentially what it's saying but the you know the crappy the, the ones that you know terence dicks wrote and they're not worth <laughs> bothering with apparently mm. i mean i think it has a point that the the the, the novelization written by david Whitaker is really good but there are you know there's still there's still ones in the, the series which are worth sticking with but anyway yeah do most films just get a bit of a bit of a crappy novelization because like you might walk into asda and see a really flimsy looking paperback that seems like it's um got giant print aimed at kids <laughs> um yeah i mean going back to alien we had like was it alan dean foster did the novelization of alien hmm. which is um highly regarded and I th- you know what i think he'd also did the alien covenant one i did read that when it came out and i, I quite en- enjoyed that more than the film <laughs> he said a few more bits in the film wasn't great. No, no, it wasn't. Funny, um, I was I mean, talking to a friend yeah. about that recently, and uh, yeah, we just didn't like it. There was a little crap. Yeah, um, but yeah, I've got a hell of a lot of alien books, which I'm trying to I'm trying to work through because I'm I'm trying to approach like the expanded alien universe um, and do something with it. Like I've tried writing my thoughts down, and I don't know how. I don't know whether I should put it in blog form or not. I. I would like to. St- I would like to do a podcast, but then you know that's time, that's money. Mm. I mean, m- mostly the time, mm-hmm. um, w- and the effort I like to put into it. You know what? I-, I couldn't. I'm enjoying doing what we're doing, and and it would take away from that. I'd have to like, you know. Um, so I don't know, but that would be something interesting to do, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> um, the first novelization I ever had was probably. Batman's uh, Batman 89 I can't remember if it was any good but because I was a kid my favourite bit was you know all the pictures in the centre <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll be we talking about the watches soon mm-hmm. um, I'm curious what made you pick this did you do some research into what stories tie into season 18 uh, yes, so um, when I had this this brilliant idea of reviewing season eighteen, it would um, I I thought I'd have a a bit of a look on on the Big Finish website, and it was quite easy to eventually work out which stories were supposed to fit in. And I thought, um, well, there's a you know there's a reasonable number there. Um, let's. F- you know, so I, I did a little bit of um, reading of the plot synopsis and tried to work out roughly where I thought they would fit in in relation to the TV series, um, which act- actually is a piece of guesswork. I think that's actually worked out. I think I've got the the you know that order pretty much spot on. But it was ju- it was doing that. Uh, I came across uh, watches, which um, you know I'd never heard of before. So I yeah. um, thought well. It's one extra story. Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, all what I knew about it was that it was a story written by Matthew Waterhouse, and he would be narrating it. But that was pretty much as far as my homework went. Um, to the point when <laughs> you mentioned Rob, that do a bit more research next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, I just I'm assumed that it would just be a couple of hours, the same length that the the actual adventures are. But uh, when you actually drop the bombshell, <laughs> no, Liam, it's seven hours. I was like, what? Uh, and indeed it is. It's seven hours long because um, it's it's effectively um, Matthew Waterhouse reading a novel. Um, um, what I didn't know was that Big Finish had actually had rights to do um, uh, books actual original novels but at some point the right the rights for them to do that stopped i'm not entirely sure when um but what they decided to do, what big finish decided to do would be um well we may not be able to publish them as as a written work but we'll um we'll effectively do them like an audio book and that's what this is oh so this wasn't written as an audio exclusive 
necessarily. It was it was written as a as a printed novel. No, no, sorry, I, I probably haven't uh, explained it well. So no, th- this was written. Uh, this was written and produced um, from the off to be to be this audio thing. Okay. Um, but previously, Big Finish had the rights to publish books, completely original, and you would be able to buy the books, and there would also be audio recordings of them. But at some point, Big Finish no longer had the, the, the rights of that stopped and big finish mm. said well what we'll do is we'll just we'll we'll do what we were doing before but obviously we, we won't be able to publish them but we will be able to record them and that's what watches is i think it's apparently th- the first one of these they did was some doctor who story involving the cybermen um and this is the second one that they did all right mm. So, um, so the plot synopsis is, and this is from the Big Finish uh, website. When the TARDIS is trapped in the vortex, the Doctor and Adric realize that there is something immensely powerful that is draining time itself from the universe. The wrecks of other time ships, the products of countless experiments in time, exist in a fused cluster in the vortex. None of them can escape, and many of their crews are dead. As the Doctor tries to free the TARDIS, he and Adric encounter threats from other groups, desperate to escape, including a hostile reptile species, mechanically enhanced cyborgs, and Daleks. But there's someone from the Doctor's own world who is watching. Someone who will prove useful when this Doctor reaches the end of his life. So the the cast and crew, Matthew Waterhouse, he's the story's narrator, as well as playing Adric, and Nicholas Briggs does the voice of the Daleks. Um, it was directed by Nigel Fares, as I said before, it was written by Matthew Waterhouse and produced by David Richardson. So, um, so effectively, what this is is that uh, Matthew Waterhouse has has written this work. I never knew until I've forgotten when it was now, a few years back. But when the season nineteen box set came out on Blu-ray, one of the special features was. Um, spending a week with Matthew Waterhouse. It's actually quite a good special feature. And during the course of that, he uh, one of the things is mentioned that he is a writer uh, and he's written original novels not related to Doctor Who at all. And I never knew that background of his. I never knew that he'd written um, original novels. Um, So I thought that that was interesting. And um, I think it's quite evident from listening to this he's quite a he's quite a talented writer he's quite skilled isn't he would you say or do you disagree um no he's quite creative yeah um so as i said this is uh, seven uh, seven hours of <laughs> listening to matthew waterhouse narrate his story uh and it's six episodes uh, yeah thank god it was episodic it, it made it um more digestible okay. <laughs> very yeah very very much so so very easy to sort of break it down um because the story is called watchers and tom baker's final televised story is logopolis has a thing has a character called the watcher in it which turns out to be a sort of intimate period of the future incarnation um I thought that Watchers would somehow tie into that, but it doesn't really. It, there's a bit of a yeah. mention later That's right. on. You, you go into it with a few presumptions, like the Master will probably be involved, mm. and the Watcher, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, Matthew Waterhouse has a, has a good time just sort of playing on your expectations there a little bit and um, subverting it. Um, so th- the story re- effectively begins actually in Paris, Um uh, and we have these two characters who are introduced. Um, what are their names, Rob? Uh, the main guy, is it Marcel? Marcel, that's it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, and Milady. Milady, yeah. So um, this is set uh, in the future, and it's just about when the Daleks are invading Earth that would you know, uh, lead into the story of the Daleks invasion of Earth but this is the very beginning um, and they're evading Paris and everyone's being exterminated including Marcel but just as he's supposed to die he comes across uh, this TARDIS and enters it 
Um, and we come across this character called Milady, and she is, we establish, she is what, what she calls as a watcher. Um, and so we get this sort of this bit of a new angle on Time Lord folk folklore, if you like, um, which is that you have this group of entities called Watchers, and they watch time and events unfold. Um, effectively just to make sure that things are running properly. Um, they do have the right to interfere, to get things on track, but they will only do that in extreme circumstances. Um, mm, yeah. I quite, you know, th- I quite liked all this uh, part of the story. What did you think? I really liked the opening story, yeah, and how it t- tied in with the invasion. Uh, I like the characters. Mm-hmm. With Milady, the t- the the time lady, there was a bit of mystery there, and you can make some assumptions about you know who is this? Mm-hmm. Um, is it someone we know? It didn't turn out to be that, but in a way, she did. Was she a bit of a proxy or um, a placeholder for like Romana, uh, but also a bit of a mirror of the Doctor? That's it. Or, or did you not see it that way? To be honest, I didn't see it that way. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with that comparison. It's um, I think that's actually quite good. But um, I see my lady more as a... I mean, I can see where you're coming from with um, with the comparison with uh, with Romana. but Especially with it being so immediate after her departure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But she's quite... Uh, but I think she's more... She, I mean, she's, she's very likeable, but she, she has this sort of very regal quality. Yeah. Um, what do you think of characters appearing who are quite similar to the Doctor? When you consider that the Doctor uh, is not meant to be the this archetypal Time Lord, and mm. um, we you know we, we all were always coming across renegades or people like on their own um, interfering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, and Milady does mention that there's quite a few renegades, and it's it's funny. You could you can you kind of could. I mean, they may not necessarily be in the same timeline as that other's do- the doctor, um, so maybe there's that a bit of allowance, but yeah. it it does take away something from the doctor a little bit. I think really it's something that you need to, I think, limit a bit. Um, I mean, the main ones that we have is, you know, we've got the meddling monk from the Hartnell era, who's the the first one that we ever encounter. Um, And he's just someone who's a bit mischievous and having fun. It's not until we get, uh, it's not until we get the master uh, where we get, you know, this is, you know, this is uh, the evil version of the Doctor, if you like. It's 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 not quite that. I mean, the master is very much his own character, but you know, he's a renegade, but he's the complete opposite of the Doctor. And then later on you get a character like the Rani who her th- her thing, which is interesting, is that she is sh- she's not evil, but she's just amoral. Um so you can do some interesting things, but when you constantly just go, oh here's another one and there's another one you know, it, it it I do think it does take away something. I don't know. What do you think? Um no I think it it does. Yeah, yeah and it's quite noticeable. Uh, it's becoming a bit of a bit of a common trait. I don't mind it, mm. but the whole mysterious aspect of the Doctor, how he's a traveller on his own, has a companion, and then we have my lady who's doing just that. <laughs> but um, yeah. I don't want to get bogged down into complaining about that, mm. which I'm not, which is pointing out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, interesting character. And I'm sure later on, isn't it implied that she was... Um, like romantically involved with someone, mm. and we thought, could that have been the Doctor? But it wasn't. No, no, it, it wasn't. Wasn't it? Um, I, I know it wasn't, yeah. Mm. But, I, n- I never yeah. thought it, w- it was going to be some, uh, someone like the Doctor. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the, there is that bit of a mystery. So, so I, like, I like it. You've got this new character, and you're automatically drawn to her. I think not only does Matthew Waterhouse do a really good job in terms of how he's written the story and how he's written these characters, um, but he also engages you as a listener. Mm. Um, maybe not necessarily during the course of the whole thing, but I'll get onto that later. 
but I th- you know I very much like the the very opening parts of the story. Every, you know everything's being yeah. set up. It's a bit of a bit of a surprise. I didn't quite expect the story to to not only begin but would turn out the way that it did. Um, yeah, the the open and the close is very much like Marcel's story and his arc, mm-hmm. I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite surprisingly it, with those two bookends, it wasn't necessarily Adric's story, but they, those two characters did kind of um, catch up with each other at one point, and and they kind of saw the similarities between them. Mm-hmm. As well, which was nice. Yeah, I mean that's another surprising thing. Actually, Andrik is is barely in this story. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean Matthew Waterhouse obviously clearly still has a huge amount of affection for not only the show in general but his time in it. Um, but yeah, the, he doesn't write uh, a story of this is the Adric show. It, it's actually the complete opposite of that. Adric is barely in it, which is quite a surprise. Um, we did get some good good uh, continuity thrown in to what he's been through. Mm-hmm. He he missed um, Alzarius. Yeah, thought thought of his brother. Mm-hmm. Um, he did dwell on like Nissa, although. Was Nissa even a major part of that story? Is it curious that you would think about her specifically? Um, but yeah, it's good. I think that actually makes sense because I think um, th- there are a couple of moments actually in the Keeper of Traken where Adric and Nissa quite like each other. If not maybe romantically, although I did think there's a little bit of a hint of that, but um, they at least enjoy each other's company. Um, so for me, I think that yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah, that's good. So going on to the the kind of uh, middle part of it, where we catch up with the Doctor and Adric arriving mm-hmm. um, in this place, um, I, I think it's it's been a, it's probably been like two weeks since I've listened to the story now, so a lot of it's be, um, become a bit of a blur. Mm. Um, did you enjoy? Um, the majority of the story yeah. yes and no there comes a point there came a point I, I got a, I've got to admit I got lost with the second episode I didn't quite know what the hell was going on yeah <laughs> uh, and in fact I think I met, uh, I think I texted you at the time and you, <laughs> you said the same thing I was like well at least it's not just me um, uh and I think it was the it second help episode. That I was listening to it at work, and then it got to the point where I was talking to people. <laughs> well, I well, had my headphones. <laughs> oh, okay, maybe that. Yeah. Um, but th- there's a lot of characters, and, and th- that, that that gets introduced. And to be perfectly honest, I think um, there were moments when I was listening to this, and I, I would go, "I'd much rather be reading it." Um, and the thing is, yeah, I'm not someone who's particularly used to audio books. You know, I'm a very keen reader. I'd much rather pick up a book and read it. Um, I mean, do, do you listen to a lot of audiobooks? I do. Um, I, I occasionally go on to Audible mm-hmm. because, because it can get offers. But I, I quite like that and uh, the way you can just jump back in. Um, I, I mean, nothing against accents, but, you know, I kind of, um, if it's a Brit, if it's, any British accent I can go into it quite easily mm. but sometimes if it's an American accent I don't quite get into the flow as well <laughs> um, yeah, some I do yeah no it's interesting with yeah. the accents I never thought of that but I don't listen to a lot of well I don't listen to audiobooks at all to be perfectly honest right nothing wrong with them it's just my thing so um, I, there, there came a point where I struggle starting to listen to this and and, and I suspect that if you are someone who is used to listen to audiobooks, listening to watches, if you like the story, you it would be a very easy thing to do. For me, on yeah. the other hand, it was I, I started to lose my patience a lot. Um, so mm. it's it's a shame it takes away your imagination, and then all of a sudden you've got Waterhouse doing all these bizarre accents and uh, funny voices. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Well, actually, for the most yeah. part, I think he really, I think he he does a really good job of that. I think he tells the story re- really well. He does engage you as a listener. I think um, the different voices he does for the characters um, is good, and he understands it as well because it's his story. Yeah, um, and I think he actually does a you know passable Tom Baker impression for when he's reading the Doctor. You do have the sort of side. cyborg characters in it though who have this guttural way of speaking those bits really tried my patience is this where we the um the voice was augmented Mm. um yeah with a bit of an effect is that right a little bit but he sort of um i don't think he talks like this a little bit, and I oh, just went, "Oh, for God's sake!" And this happened. You know, these characters are in it, and they, they talk like this, and there's there's backwards and forwards with these type type of thing. And it, it, I just oh, it really really tried my patience. And even though no one could hear me listening to it because I had my my earphones in, I actually was embarrassed by it as well. <laughs> um. So though those moments I, I wasn't particularly keen on, but I mean I really, as I said before, I really liked the first episode just in general. I got lost with the second, the third episode. I felt like I was getting back into the story, and you know, actually, Rob, you you mentioned before where you think these mo- the, the, there were these moments when the master is going to come in, and and he doesn't. But the way that mm. that sort of expectation of yours is subverted, I think, is really rather nice. So there's a bit where my lady and Marcel are in this garden, which is inside a spaceship. And they realise that all these stone statues, all of them are TARDISes. And they start investigating them. And there's one where they go in. And I, I love, I actually really love this part of the story. I love the, the imagery that Matthew Waterhouse uh, depicts and how he tells it. And there's a bit of an atmosphere and they go inside this TARDIS and the way that he describes the interior and the fact that there's a clock and the clock is a TARDIS. And I thought mm. that was like, ooh, the master's around. And they go in, uh, but it isn't. It's actually a toy TARDIS that uh, Time Tots <laughs> yeah. uh, would use, which I just think, you know what? That is just such a... I don't think anyone's ever thought of that as an idea. I just think that's a lovely idea. You know, uh time lord children having their own toy tardises i just think that's really rather sweet it's just like yeah, why didn't we have those yeah why don't we have those um i just thought yeah, it was just actually just a really nice story uh, just sorry just a, a really nice idea and the fact that matthew waterhouse takes a little bit of time just to incorporate that idea in and the way that he does that i thought yeah that, that's that's delightful yeah and he did dip into the law of tardises a little bit because we um we had different types of TARDISes as well, mm-hmm. um, especially with Milady. I think she had a, a greater than Type Forty, possibly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and some earlier ones too. <laughs> um, the stuff with all the the extra characters um, has become a bit of a blur to me. Mm. Um, I did like the whole mystery of the Doctor and Adric showing up, though. And it's all um, long since abandoned, it seems. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought it was good, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was good. But it's it's funny, there's a bit where... So, um, you have the Daleks in the very first episode with them invading Earth, and that's how Marcel is brought into the story, introduced and thrown into the TARDIS, and he goes on this adventure accidentally. Um, And then sort of halfway or just after halfway in the story the Daleks come back again um oh and he's really pissed off eventually isn't he because he um assumes his partner has died mm. yeah um but it's not sorry I'm probably jumping ahead here aren't I a little bit but no, no that's fine I, I, I think yeah so uh, again another thing that um Matthew Waterhouse does is he, he has this character Marcel and he was in a relationship, and he's talking about how Marcel misses his uh, misses his boyfriend, and 
you know, there's, so there's an emotional element that's brought into the story, and I think done. It's I don't think it's overplayed. It's not underplayed either. I think it's just pitched perfectly. Um, the way that that is brought in and out of the story, I think, is very believable, and and and, and the way that it's done, I think, is quite nice. Um, it has a bit of a payoff towards the end of the story, which isn't tragic, but it is. It's a bit bittersweet, but we'll we'll mention that later. But I think um, the whole the way that that is brought into the story and woven in and the and how that's um, brought to an end, I think is um, I quite like how that's done. But just going back to it, I mean, when I think about watches, uh, I think about you know the characters in it, the situation that they're in, the moments that they encounter. The thing that I don't really think about is the Daleks. No. I, to be perfectly honest, I think I don't think the Daleks were needed in this story. To be perfectly honest, I don't know what are your thoughts. I think they were they were a fine plot device to use for the invasion. It, it's um, it's a very memorable point in Doctor Who history mm. that they've used. So it helps you kind of understand this place and time. Um, so I think that I think they were utilized well. All right, okay. I mean, there's, there's no harm having them in. No, no, not at all. I just think um, there's something about the way th- th- the story. I don't think they were. I think they could have easily been, re- you know, th- written out. Obviously, not completely. You would still have to have tweaked the story. But if the Daleks weren't in, I don't think anything would have been lost. Having said that, though, the fact that they are there, and in the scheme of things, with how this is plotted, it's the penultimate story of the Tom Baker era and Matthew Waterhouse does this nice little idea I think in fact because the, the Daleks mentioned the fact that this Doctor was brought back to destroy them so th- the Daleks make an attempt later on to try and wipe the Doctor out of uh, history completely as well and it's a bit of a it's a nice little bookend from Genesis of the Daleks which was at the very beginning of um uh, the Tom Baker era, and if this were to be Tom Baker's penultimate story, uh, which, if you were to include this, would you know is in the continuity, then the Daleks um, trying to you know uh, try and get the revenge from from that story is quite a nice little bookend to it. Mm. Yeah, good point. Is there anything more you want to talk about of the? Um the middle of the story that we haven't really discussed the whole nature of um, these characters and why they're there it, it, it gets a bit funny really because we we establish that um, there's this void in time everything you know time's being dragged into it and all time travel all vessels capable of time travel are being drawn into it and are trapped there. Um, but with within all that going on, I've got to say that I do think there's a there's a lot there which feels a bit unnecessary. Like there, there are characters there which, um, when I was listening to it, thinking, I found at this point my patience with the story was really wearing thin at this point, and. It, Again, I think maybe this goes to the fact that I'm not really used to listening to audiobooks. Um, and there were big parts of this. I said I would much rather re- be reading the book myself rather than listening to it. Um, but at this point, it was I, I really started to lose patience an awful lot. And I just, there were lots, there were parts when I was listening, I just got, I want this thing to end now. Um <laughs> I don't know whether you thought the same, but I just thought that you know there the were the moments in the story and characters in the story where I thought, why is this here? Mm. No, I did feel the same, and I hadn't thought about it until now. But yeah, it would have been would have been better as a book. Mm. What? Well, yeah, read it at your own pace. Yeah. yeah, and and being able to to picture things in in your own way. It's got nothing to do with Matthew Waterhouse, as I said, because he does. Um, he is able to tell the story effectively, um, but yeah, just listen to it as a as a as an audio experience. I just went, oh, this could this 
could have been edited. This doesn't need to be seven hours long. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, maybe that's like a detriment of having someone write the story, perform the story, mm. and have it not heavily edited um, from a writing point of view as well. Mm. So um, when you indulge someone in their own story, um, you know, having um, other people coming in um, to improve it. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe, um, yeah. But yeah, because it's, it's a unique format. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's no, I guess there's, there's, they don't regularly do um, audio novels, I'm guessing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So did you enjoy the um, the third act a bit better as things started to come to a head? I did, uh, but that was because it was just like, right, we're coming to the end now, thank God. Um But, uh, but funny enough, at th- but at this point in the story, um, I had, I didn't, I wasn't really interested in Adric as a character. I wasn't really interested in anything to do with the Daleks or the Doctor, to be perfectly honest. Um, the people I was really interested in were Marcel and Milady. So when the story started to focus on, on them and what they were doing and what they were experiencing... That was the bit of the story that I was really interested in. Um, so when the Doctor starts to investigate what's going on with his time bubble and who is responsible for it, um, I was just like, right, okay, great. I I couldn't give a toss really. But when they were, t- but when it was Milady and and Marcel, because I really liked those characters. Um, I found that that's what I was gravitating more toward, and that was the stuff that I was really enjoying. Yeah, um, especially um, Marcel's kind of development, mm-hmm. because near the end he has another op- opportunity to kind of face off with the Daleks, mm-hmm. um, and you know he wants revenge at this point. Um, but he doesn't. He doesn't die. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where he goes. But then, doesn't he feel? Um, bad with himself because he wanted revenge and that's not who he wants to be. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he is a per, you know, he does go through this character development and I think that is really handled very well. But the bits that I really liked was when uh, Milady gives him the opportunity to um, find out what happened to his boyfriend. And um, there's something quite nice with that. Um, tragic, but nice. It, yeah, yeah, tragic and nice. Finds out that he didn't die, he lived, so that's great. But he realises at this point, because it's years later, and I think you know it's years after the Dalek invasion. Decades, I think, possibly. Y- yeah, yeah. Um, that his boyfriend didn't forget Marcel, which is nice, but he's moved on with his life. And as a result of that, it's it's like Marcel can't, he can't go back. He can't, he can't, you know, sort of like interfere because that would affect, you know. So it's bittersweet. Um, you know, uh, his lover didn't die, was able to move on with his life, which was great. But that means that Marcel can never be with him again. Yeah, and when he looks looks at his, um, his boyfriend through the window... Mm. He sees a picture of him with his new partner, but also a picture of himself. Yeah, there as well. With him. And my lady pointing out, he's like, he never forgot you, and he still remembers you. So, yeah, uh, I, you know, I love that. It um, because I just thought it was emotionally engaging, but in a really good way. And again, you know, I liked what Matthew Waterhouse did, both in terms of as a, as a writer and reading this. Um, so the, those was the, you know the, by that point this was the stuff that I was really drawn to in the story, and it's like right I want to I want to have a series of stories you know with what does Marcel do afterwards you know uh, because he effectively he, he becomes a watcher at the end and he has his own TARDIS um, right I want a, I want a series of adventures with my lady and um, 
and and Marcel. That's what I that's what I became really interested in. The stuff with the, the doctor and Hattrick was just like, ah, who cares? Yeah. Well, we've had enough of the those, you know, in many stories. <laughs> do do they really need to be fleshed out even more? Mm. And um yeah, hats off to uh, Waterhouse for doing some like new and original characters mm-hmm. and bringing in all this emotion and development with the characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In this case, in this reasonably well-rounded story, yeah. So yeah, it was good. Yeah. Apart from in the middle, <laughs> yeah, it was middle. too too long. <laughs> a lot of filler, a lot of filler. Yeah. But, uh, so in terms of a, well, actually, I may be leaping ahead. Is there, is there anything else that you want to talk about in relation to this? Um, not particularly. I like the new characters. Do you think it um it adds anything to the Doctor and Adric? Do you think it adds any any um any more substance to the the season eighteen? Mm. No. No, no. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I don't. There are great things and wonderful, delightful elements of the story, and I think if. There are parts of this which I, I would definitely recommend people, but at the end of the day, it's... I wouldn't say it was essential. I don't know. What do you no. think? No, definitely not. And it doesn't answer any major questions, you know. If, you, if you're thinking, like, The Watcher, what the hell was that all about in, in Legopolis? Mm. Um, it's not going to really answer that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, maybe that's a question for us to talk about in, in a few weeks. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, it was good. I'm glad we, I'm glad we've done it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe in better circumstances where I could have like spent a bit, <laughs> bit, a bit more time <laughs> taking it in. <laughs> yeah, it was enjoyable. Yeah. So, in terms of a rating, what would you give it? Um, I would give it a good rating, but I'd say you know, give us the cut down version. <laughs> <bit. laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because there's. I don't think average would really give us the story justice because there's some really, really good stuff there. Um, yeah, of course. I couldn't write characters this well. Yeah. Um, but there were parts of it which were, you know, so, so, you know, and there were great parts of the story. And it's like, I'm pleased that I actually experienced this. It's It was great. But at the same time, there were lots of it. I got to admit, I just going, I think this is padding. and This is really trying my patience. So you know there is a there is a little bit of that but yeah i think on on the whole i would say this was this was good of course yeah (laughs) would you revisit it one day uh hmm. you know what i may do actually um and i probably (laughs) i probably enjoyed a lot more because it wouldn't be for the purposes like reviewing for a podcast i'd be able to probably enjoy it uh and it's not a race to get to the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah how's it going to end? Um, so yeah, I think of, would you? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's. I think that's all we've got to say about watches. I think so. Yeah. Um, so we are nearly out of it. We've got um, next week. We'll do the um, the comic strip of the Star Beast, mm-hmm. and then the week after that. Will be our f- grand big finale with Legopolis. Yeah, it's been a long time coming, but we're, you know we're nearly there. <laughs> it's been over a year. And we'll be t- we'll be taking a short break before we do our big re relaunch rebrand. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that what we're calling it? Uh, Are we rebranding much, Liam, or is it a bit of a gimmick that we're putting out there? <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a hiatus, really. Um, yeah, just, uh, we'll come back refreshed. We've had a bit of sleep. Time to think about stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, plan things a little bit more in advance. Um, structure yeah. things a bit better. It, just a bit more polished. But we, it, it's, yeah. it's also the opportunity just to have a bit of a break, uh, which yeah. I think we need. It's, it's getting to the point where it feels like... Because we, we enjoy doing the podcast, but it feels like it's becoming a bit of a slog to do. But that's simply because, you know, because <laughs> we, we need a break. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we, yeah. you know, we're with the sixtieth, mm. you know what? I'm going to go into it enthusiastically, and yeah, I don't want to go into it tired and sick of the show, but uh, which I'm not quite. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go into it um, 
optimistic that's going to be good mm-hmm. and um looking forward to it so as we build up towards the 60th i thought we could like fix what needs fixed mm-hmm. change what needs changed um one thing was the website so this week i've been going on every day looking at a thing and what can we tweak um so i've smartened up the front page of it so we have a a big featured slider at the top which gives um listen uh, visitors more information right there so they can learn more about the podcast they can learn about what we are doing in the build up to the 60th yes. um look at reviews um access to patreon and if they scroll down there's um more detailed blurb about the posts as well um so i think visually it's looking a bit better mm-hmm. and i've streamlined some of the stuff on there as well so if um if previously log p- people could go on and log in um and earn all these badges and coins and stuff like that so i think and you were like what why have we got this why have we got close to all coins so <laughs> don't worry Liam. i thought well what was i doing there we've toned that down <laughs> <laughs> right okay um badges i've now renamed achievements okay. so um people can go on they can unlock achievements by doing certain things and um these achievements can be looked at on your profile um i've also created on a trial basis as we go over the 60th um we all know that uh twitter is no more so you know we usually do our twitter polls don't we Liam? yes yeah so now it's just x <laughs> so i think do we do the x polls or <laughs> Why not trial doing polls on the website for a change? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So we've created um, a section of the website called the polling station where you can go cast your vote in the ballot box and then leave some feedback on a story. We'll have that running weekly. So you can go on there, just go on the front page, scroll down and it will be right there. Um, and also... um. We did have we do have a Discord, um, bit of a degree of separation for people to go there. So um, on a trial basis, I've put a message board there as well. If anyone wants to go on, that are logged on. Um, there's a general discussion page. There's a chat page on classic era, new era, new era as well. Um, just so we can kind of keep things all in one place, you know, like so closebellpodcast dot com is like the best place to be <laughs> no no you've done a, great, a really yeah. good job updating the website so yeah um thanks for that rob and yeah uh check it out um the layout is a, is a lot better rob's done a great job and yeah it's um everything's more in-house yeah. and easier to navigate around and what have you so oh yeah and one other thing that uh we've mentioned on whatsapp and i guess i've put it i've put it on the, the what's coming up page on the website um, I suggested to you, why not do roundtable episodes where we don't necessarily do a review, but we can bring guests on and just have a chat. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that will be like a bit of a nicer format so we don't get kind of bogged down in a story that some people might might or might not like. Why don't we just have a chat? Yeah, I like that um, a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've, I've also improved the login section of the website, but there's an exclusive bit for co-hosts so if we invite someone on they log on to the website they can then access all of our um production notes and there's also a private message board just for co-hosts so we can leave each other messages and stuff like that mm. oh, that's good oh, yeah mm-hmm. yeah uh so what else we got to talk about today um yeah nothing else to add from me yeah oh well we'll see you all next week Yep, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. The TARDIS Cloister Bell. Imminent disaster. The Cloister Bell? Yes. What's that? 
Well, it's a sort of communications device reserved for wild catastrophes and sudden calls to man the battle stations. That's the cloister bell. Don't worry about that for now. It's not really terribly significant. The cloister bell? Oh, no.